about technology and whatever, or I'm sorry, job uh, titles, you never ask about like developer relations, developer advocate, developer evangelist. I mean, come on. That's what a lot of us came here for and that's what we do, so. Uh, my name's John Bannon. I'm gonna talk about myself in a second, but I didn't change the title. I'm at Bizarre Voice uh, and this is the title of my presentation. So who am I? Uh, senior developer advocate at Bizarre Voice. I've been there for five years. Uh, so as hopefully most of you know, what developer advocates and developer evangelists do um, in a typical job. If I work with the API at Bizarre Voice. Uh, we handle escalation points and support. Uh, we write tutorials and documentation for the developer portal. So developer.bizarrevoice.com. Uh, my coworker Frederick and I own all of that content. Uh, we manage. API keys, and we also solicit feedback from uh, our users on the API and drive new products uh, new, and new features. And we also monitor quotas and uh, rate limits on the API. Uh, hopefully, people know something about Bizarre Voice. Can I just get a show of hands? Has anybody heard of Bizarre Voice and know what they do? Really? Okay, that's great. So Bizarre Voice was founded in 2005. Primarily, they are ratings and review uh, platform for anything you buy online. You read the ratings and reviews before you buy them. Uh, this is the marketing spiel I was told to put in my slides. So the clear market leader in providing the world's top retailers. Yeah, clap. Okay, there you go. Uh, we have over 6,000 clients and a third of them, uh, roughly a third are on the API or API exclusive. Everyone uses our API if you're a hosted display client or an API client, enterprise client. Um, but primarily a third of um, we consider enterprise and your API only. Uh, some of the traffic numbers we hit, we have 13 million requests during Black Friday that hit our origin server, so it's pretty significant. Uh, we provide 3,700 requests per minute. We satisfy those, and some of the bigger clients include Home Depot, you might have gone there to buy some lumber, Walmart, you might have gone there to buy whatever, uh, Best Buy, your electronic stuff. Those are just three of some of the top ones, and we also have, uh, we're also global at the same time. So there comes the question of how do we satisfy all these requests? It's a significant number of requests. Uh, we use Apogee. Apogee was recently acquired by Google or Alphabet a couple years ago or so. Um, they're our third-party uh, API gateway, uh, our CDN, and proxy to our API requests. These are just some of the APIs that are more public-facing. Um, what else about Apogee? Uh, all of these, uh, our APIs are not RESTful. We have some that are more considered bulk APIs. Um, but Apogee handles everything, rate limits, again, our CDN, because we can piggyback off global, or I'm sorry, Google's global kind of network. Uh, it's, it's been a good solution. We recently migrated about two years ago from uh, Mashery to Apogee. So if anybody has questions about Apogee or like why we're using them, I'm, feel free to talk about that. Uh, so I'm on what is now known as the App API Edge team. Uh, we were, API infrastructure, API, and it consists of QA developers, developer advocates, and also product owners and product managers. And at the time when we decided to democratize the API, we were responsible for the external APIs and, and the internal APIs. So really what this meant was we were a giant bottleneck for the whole company. If you want an API in the company, you came through us, we had to set it up, set up the rules, you know, kind of learn the logic, and it was, it was a bottleneck. People couldn't get their work done in a timely manner. So we came up with this idea. Oh, this is kind of just a quick overview of what we owned and decided not to own. So this is kind of a overview of some of the APIs. The green and blue were the ones we claimed ownership and the red and yellow were the ones that were kind of, we didn't want to touch. Someone else needed to own the logic and all that infrastructure, but it all fell in our laps. So at the time, we were supporting, you know, uh, these are the ones we did not want to support so much, the privacy API for GDPR, client response, personalization, product sentiments. Uh, we acquired a company called AdStructure that does natural language processing to understand product sentiments on reviews. Uh, these were the ones that we didn't really know the logic, like how were these, how were they making, uh, creating the response and the data to respond to the API. 
we could set up the, uh, the endpoints, but other than that, we didn't want to own it. So we decided to this, uh, come up with this idea of democratizing the API. Let's give all the developers for the different endpoints and the different uh, domains of knowledge access to Apigee and let them set things up. Um, so allow anyone at BB to start, uh, put up an API and work it through Apigee, but we needed to put some rules in place first. Um, we wanted to give every team the ability to, to own what they develop in a way, uh, all the way to the API edge. So we sat down and came up with the guiding principles. It's this holy grail document we have on our Confluence page, uh, internal documentation of 11 bullet points, and you can't read them, they're all, it's too small, but I'll go through most of them of what all external and internal APIs should adhere to. So just like traffic rules and sporting game rules, you need to have rules and regulations and a contract that a common language that people speak. So I'm gonna go through some of them and to highlight them. So it's, it's intended for enterprise clients only. So as I mentioned earlier, enterprise clients, those uh, are, only, are the only ones accessible who have access to our API. So those are some of like the Walmarts, uh, the Best Buys, as I mentioned, and, and higher ASF, people who are spending more money um, with Bizarre Voice. So another rule is endpoints should be intuitive and be based on the intended use. So if you hit the reviews endpoint, you shouldn't get back consumer information about that person. You should get a review. Pretty intuitive. They should be easy uh, to use and appropriate for the client developers. Um, makes sense. Features should be uniformly available across the platform. If it's available in the UI, then the API should have it also. So this was a big sticking point where our hosted display uh, team, which two-thirds of our clients use, had features that no API clients could use at the time. So one of them was called Progressive Submission. This came out, I don't know, a couple of years ago probably, not quite, on uh, hosted display. So we just released this, I don't know, probably in the last couple of weeks on API. So it wasn't feature parity at all. Um, well, use well-known and industry standards over in-house custom non-standards. But wait, I've got more. They must be stable and reliable in the established uh, service level agreements. Um, internal and external documentation is, is important as the application code itself. So we, when developing this, we had the must, should, may. I was kind of upset this didn't have the must because I had write documentation. So we'll get back to that one. Uh, provide a level of security consistency with their purpose. So GDPR, we put OAuth on top of that, and client response, we put OAuth on top of that. Um, but for the reviews endpoint, it's publicly facing, uh, hosted on most websites, so we did not put it on that. Um, supported services. Uh, oh, so our service team, our product team, and our go-to-market team must be aware of it and support this API when it comes out. Um, Public APIs must follow a standard set of guidelines so that interfaces are similar, so a similar call pattern. I'll show you that in a second. And traffic must be accessible through whatever log file system we're using at the time. Some additional considerations we needed to conform to Hypertext uh, Transfer Protocol. Um, use the correct methods. Everything's not a git anymore, which is great. You post submissions, you post reviews, you don't get them. Uh, correct headers, and we also return correct statuses, 200s, 400s, and 500s. And this is what I was saying, the scheme should follow this, the host, the service name, version, endpoint, and then any query string parameters. Other considerations, uh, Bizarre Voice public API should implement cores. Uh, any change management, we're deprecating your, either one of those states for any of the APIs, deprecated, sunsetted, active, or the latest version. Security, we also go through our security audit so we don't expose any public PII, public identifiable information. Um, it's privacy or public, I can't remember. Personal, Personal. thank you. Uh, limits and offset, every API endpoint has limits and offsets, pagination, localization, and then rate limiting. So we came up with this giant document. In addition, uh, we provide people uh, who are going to use Apigee as their API gateway a training on how to, uh, to Apigee. It's an onboarding uh, exercise and there's documentation on how the shared workflows work, the proxy, the trace sessions, and the CI CD. 
think of this as like the training wheels for anyone coming up. We walk through the, a program with them, so then they're off and running. So now, anyone at Bizarre Voice? Oh, work. You, everybody gets an API, it's easy. <laughs> everybody gets an API. Check under your chairs, there's not an API, I'm just kidding. With the proper training. So the stated benefits of when we started this was increase uniformity between Bizarre Voice public APIs, uh, reduce ambigu ambiguity, and improve the experience of API consumers. So the wins from the democratization process were it freed up our team to do the work we need to do and not have to be the bottleneck anymore. Uh, we migrated to a new API key management system, rate limiting was a big thing, and Black Friday, as you can imagine, when I, when I mentioned all the traffic we get, is now being fully worked on and supported and, and uh, scoped. And we also have innovation coming up, uh, the next version of API. We can actually talk about it and not be full of shit anymore. I'm like, this is coming. Uh, and we're also creating client-facing tools that are helping expose a client's API usage. So beforehand, when Best Buy wanted to know, hey, how many API calls did we go over rate limit last week? I would have to say, I don't know. I have to go into the Kibana logs and look it up. Call me back in a week. Where now we're gonna expose that and let them search it for themselves. But we also had some issues. As I mentioned, mentioned earlier, the documentation as an afterthought, it should be a must. We must document that. I'm looking at my boss, Ryan. Uh, <laughs> And we also had some inconsistent parameters where, uh, I don't know, like one parameter was uh, hidden equals true, another uh, API might just say hidden. Like it's not consistent, it's a bad user experience. I think we need to consider the developer, developer experience much more. So these are my suggested improvements. Whoever did the mock server uh, talk a couple weeks ago or a couple months ago with this last one, I really want to, I'm interested in that, setting up a mock servers to have that used. It was Stoplight, wasn't it? Well, I don't work anymore. I know, but it, I know, but it was awesome. Yeah, I, I'm really interested in that. And then also, we need to go back and do work to retrofit our APIs. But the mock server, you get it up and running in your developer experiences. I can test this thing day one when they set it up. So here's the final slide. I have a question to the audience. How many people have set this guiding principle up when you create APIs with your company, and how does it work for you guys? Anyone? <laughs> has anyone, you, come on, anybody in the company has like a guiding principle, where you're gonna set up an API for your company, it's gotta have this, this, and this? James, kind of happy. So what are your, what's your experience doing that? What, so it, it's like you try to set a guideline and no one follows it, yeah, or? Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Don't, let's make a t-shirt, don't be the bottleneck next time. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else experience? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a accurate comparison. A style guide for APIs is kind of what we tried to develop here. And uh, yeah, if anybody, yes. That's a great question. It depends on how. Uh, Do you like an audit as an endpoint gets added, or how? Does that That's work? what I would like. It depends also what how the product team is go to how fast they want to go to market. So, sad story that progressive submission endpoint we needed it out, right. you know, and um, 
we needed it out yesterday. So it got to me in the documentation to test it, and I was like, no, this doesn't work. This is bad. This is bad. Why aren't we using the same error messages here as submission? And they're like, we don't have time to fix this. So it's 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 a tough kind of. I don't have a stick to hit the hit you know the developers say go back and fix this. What's you know? I think the peer review process, yeah, I, I think they should get the DX developer experience and developer advocates involved from day one, and, and, you, and, and that's what we didn't do. So, yeah, it's, it's a, a lesson yeah, to be learned and just get developers involved from the get-go and try to be consistent. Like, if this one endpoint is used, this has this syntax, the other one in your same company should probably be pretty similar, so. Well, thank you.